Every so often, I think about starting a gimmick account on Twitter devoted to recycled tweets. You see, Twitter is weird in that the exact same post, tweeted from a different account, will go viral every year or so, and no one seems to notice or care. So sometimes, I think it would be fun to be an obnoxious call-out guy who ruins everyone's fun. That's basically what I already am on Twitter anyways. By the way, I would love it if you followed me, at ScoobMySteve. By far, my favorite recycled tweet is this one about the supposed inefficiency of capitalism. In case you're just listening, it's that meme that shows a plastic cup filled with pears that says, Pears grown in Argentina, packed in Thailand. And below is a world map showing just how far the fruit has traveled, from Argentina to Thailand to New York, where presumably the picture was taken. The person who tweets these pictures out usually includes some caption along the lines of Capitalism Bad. Most recently, the left-wing Twitter account Zisquirrel tweeted it out, sarcastically saying, Capitalism is efficient. Again, if you've been on Twitter for more than a year, you've probably seen this post at least twice. Every few months, it pops up and people retweet it like it's some amazing discovery. Now, there are a lot of ways in which you can pick this meme apart. In fact, a few people already have. There's a very good video from a channel called Brit Monkey breaking it down. Brit Monkey goes over how consumer preferences, the specifics of produce, comparative advantage, and low shipping costs all factor into shaping what seems at first glance to be a convoluted way to get food to people, but is actually a modern marvel in supply chain efficiency. I'll link the video below just in case you want to watch it for yourself. I'll be taking the meme on from a slightly different perspective here. Specifically, I'll be arguing that not only is this highly efficient, it's the government, not capitalism, that usually creates inefficiencies that capitalism is blamed for. And the food industry is a great example of that. Most of my audience, like me, lives in the United States. I don't know what it's like in other countries, but here in the US, capitalism, among a certain community, is used interchangeably with bad. I'm thinking specifically of that one Jackman tweet from 2017, where they show a picture of that New Jersey governor, Chris Christie, on the beach, with the caption, Capitalism. The story here is that Chris Christie, as governor, shut down a public beach in New Jersey, then went to it with a small group of family and friends. How exactly that's capitalism, I'm not sure. So, a lot of the capitalism bad discourse is either people being dishonest, or at the very least, genuinely misinformed as to what capitalism actually is. But there's also an institutional reason in the United States that helps explain why capitalism is so frequently blamed for things that are often the fault of the government. You see, outside of paying income taxes, driving, or getting your mail, your average American adult very rarely interacts directly with the government. And yet, governments, local, state, and federal, take lots of your money, have tons of rules, and employ lots of people. How can both of these things be true at the same time? Economist Brian Kaplan once contemplated this question in a blog post. How is this possible when the government regulates almost every aspect of American life and takes 40% of GDP? The government controls the labor market, especially for foreign workers. Government decides what products I can and can't buy. The government runs a massive retirement system that I can't escape without leaving the country. How can the government control me so thoroughly, yet so rarely boss me around? The answer is simple yet shocking. Government controls me by controlling my trading partners. Government doesn't tell me to pay sales taxes. It just forces every business in Virginia to collect sales taxes as a condition of sale. Government doesn't tell me who I can and can't hire. It just tells every business I deal with who they can and can't hire. Government doesn't even tell me I have to contribute to Social Security. It just requires my employer to make contributions on my behalf as a condition of employing me. The government operates through a veil, which absolves it of so much of its accountability, and often, private industry, the conduit through which the government operates, is left to blame. This is especially true with the production of food. Let's take a look at this clip from Rising back when Crystal and Sagar were still hosting. Crystal said this right around the time the COVID-19 pandemic started. Of course, we should have the ability to supply our own medical mm. supplies and essentials and many other things, by the way. Food supply is another one that I would throw in there as well. And it's ironic, the defense, because it's like, you know, these neoliberals uh, in the Democratic Party and in the Republican Party are the ones who allowed all that stuff to go over to China. And now that it's there, the argument is, well, we can't make them mad because they have all our stuff. Like, we need them. Well, you're the 
one who created that dependency. It's remarkable that someone whose job it is to cover politics and policy doesn't seem to know that this is already the operating policy of the U.S. federal government. Growing food within the borders of the United States is one of the main goals of the Farm Bill. As Daniel Himhoff writes in The Farm Bill, A Citizen's Guide, just as a strong defense is regarded as national security, a diverse and well-developed agriculture is regarded as food security. In the United States, the Department of Agriculture is charged with this dual mission, support the creation of an abundant food supply, and ensure that all citizens receive basic nutrition. As we'll see, the United States federal government is not unique here. When I listen to populists talk about how the United States has embraced unfettered free trade, and that we operate according to the principles of free market fundamentalism, I get the awful impression that they've never looked into U.S. agricultural policy. In a sense, it's a poster boy for autarky. As Robert Paulberg writes in Food Politics, In resistance to globalization, most food around the world continues to be grown, harvested, processed, retailed, and consumed entirely within the borders of individual countries. 90% of processed foods are never traded, along with 79% of wheat and 93% of rice. This pattern persists, despite the modern era of lower transportation costs, because most countries do not want to depend on other countries for their basic food supply. So they have set in place policies intended to preserve self-sufficiency. National governments remain the dominant actors in food and farming. They are in a position to take this leading role because of the exclusive legal jurisdiction that they enjoy, as sovereign states, over farms and food markets within their own borders. I'm aware of the fact that some people look at this and think it's a good thing. To that I say, okay, but if you insist on criticizing capitalism, you're going to have to pick a different industry. Also, it's important to understand how exactly governments go about achieving these results. In the U.S., billions of dollars are spent every year by the federal government subsidizing farms. This number increased during the Trump administration due to his idiotic trade war with China. They also increased during COVID. It largely does not go to family farms either, but large, politically well-connected operations. This usually goes by the euphemism of farm aid, but I prefer to call it what it is, corporate welfare. These subsidies are in place to keep certain foods artificially cheap here, to prevent production from being undercut by cheaper imports. Other protectionist measures are also in place, such as tariffs and import restrictions, ostensibly to keep food production in place. Everything from corn to dairy to peanut butter has tariffs on it. The most notorious example of this in the United States is probably sugar. I've talked about the sugar industry on this channel before, and I've previously read this quotation from Florida Senator Marco Rubio justifying protectionism for that crop. I'm going to read it again just because it's so remarkable, especially from a supposed fan of free markets. Rubio said, I'm prepared to say, absolutely, we should change the law so that as soon as countries get rid of their sugar subsidies, we get rid of ours. And then there will be a free market for being able to sell food. Otherwise, these other countries will capture the market share. Our agricultural capacity will be developed into real estate, you know, and housing and so forth. You know, stuff that people definitely don't need and then we lose the capacity to produce our own food. At which point, we're at the mercy of a foreign country for our food security. This policy makes sugar more expensive than it needs to be. In fact, the average price Americans pay for sugar is well above the global price. The next time you're drinking a soda and you look at the ingredients listed and see high fructose corn syrup instead of sugar, just remember, that's for your safety. The unfortunate part about preventing global trade is that it denies us the benefits of greater comparative advantage. Comparative advantage is a fairly easy concept to grasp when it comes to food production. We could grow our own pears up here in Wisconsin year-round if we built enough greenhouses. But it's way easier and way less expensive to buy them from areas of the planet that are warmer. Meanwhile, our fertile soil up here lends itself well to growing crops like corn and wheat. When everyone is doing what they're best at, the world produces more overall, and people have much more to exchange with one another. Furthermore, thanks to containerization and large shipping vessels, transportation by sea keeps costs very low. BritMonkey breaks down just how cheap it is to ship a container full of pears in his video. Pears are 178 grams, and each shipping container can hold up to 24,000 kilograms. That's 135,000 pears. Shipping one container from Asia to North America costs about $2,500, or 1.8 cents per pair. 
And that's how it costs mere pennies for companies to lug vast amounts of food across the world, and how exotic fruit ends up on your dining table at any time of the year. Internationally, shipping by water is the cheapest way to get goods from point A to point B. It's also the least impactful in terms of greenhouse emissions. According to the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, the greenhouse gas emissions of freight transported on ships is considerably lower per ton shipped than shipping by truck, rail, pipeline, or air. Thanks to low shipping costs, we can have more variety in our diets while also being more efficient. This combination produces some surprising and impressive results. As Paulberg writes, In the United Kingdom, lamb meat that travels 11,000 miles from New Zealand generates only one quarter of the carbon emissions per pound compared to British lamb because farmers in the United Kingdom raise their animals on feed, which must be produced using fossil fuels, rather than on clover pasture land. It's usually cheaper for the British to buy lamb from New Zealand as well. Though, not always, as prices include more than just transportation and energy costs. Unfortunately, we don't transport nearly as much product by ship as we could domestically. Not because of evil, inefficient capitalism, but because of the government holding on to a Wilson-era law known as the Jones Act. I've talked about the Jones Act before, but just to refresh your memory, the Jones Act requires that all goods transported by water between U.S. ports be carried on ships that have been constructed in the United States and fly the U.S. flag, are owned by U.S. citizens, and are crewed by U.S. citizens and U.S. permanent residents. This makes shipping within the United States domestically artificially more expensive. As Timothy Fitzgerald writes in his essay, The Environmental Case for Jones Act Reform, marine shipping is not competitive with alternative modes, with the natural advantages of marine transport likely undermined by higher operating expenses. Estimates of the higher operating costs vary from 13 to 170 percent. In 2018, the Organization for Economic Cooperating and Development rated U.S. maritime freight as 60 percent more restrictive than the average OECD country. The costs are even more stark when you take the environmental impact into account. As Fitzgerald writes, Including environmental costs would likely make water transport more attractive on net, because its external costs are small relative to alternative modes. Water transport has the lowest greenhouse emissions of any mode. One-third lower than pipeline, 70% lower than rail, more than 80% lower than truck, and hundreds of times lower than air. Including environmental costs increases the net distortion created by underutilizing marine shipping. So to recap, international trade when it comes to food is artificially hobbled thanks to government laws that subsidize food here and makes many imports more expensive than they would otherwise be through tariffs and other protectionist measures. Shipping by sea is incredibly efficient, except domestically we don't reap the benefits because of the Jones Act. And your average person, and Twitter leftists who love to disparage capitalism, are completely unaware of this. Mostly because the government is regulating things through companies. Capitalism isn't perfect, but if you insist on criticizing it on Twitter, at least try to be informed and honest. And don't use this stupid meme. Shipping pears that are picked in Argentina, packaged in Thailand, and consumed in New York is just about as efficient as it gets. Dredging the Everglades to grow subsidized sugarcane to produce some of the most expensive sugar in the world is the inefficient way to do things. Mm.